What I'll do is I'll just give you a very briefest of company overviews for those who, who may or may not have heard of us. I'll talk a bit about the zinc market, not to, uh, to try and tell people what they know about metal markets, but for those that aren't familiar with it, it'll give you a good baseline for talking about our zinc project in Saudi Arabia, which is ready to go into construction, and it is in fact the next mine in Saudi Arabia uh, ready to, to build. And then I will talk about that project, and at the tail end I'll just cover off on our Omani copper gold project that is uh, just one stage behind and is heading into DFS, or feasibility study. And then I'll wrap it up, of course. Just give you a sense of the company overview, a sense of our board. Um, our Ian Williams on the left is our chairman. He is a long-term Rio uh, Tinto man. He has both built and operated the Century Zinc Mine, which is, which is now under MMG but, and shutting down, but uh, was the largest zinc mine up until uh, till recently in the world. Um, the rest uh, speak for themselves. And on the uh, right-hand side, um, His Royal Highness uh, uh, Prince Abdullah joined our board in the last year has recently been um, promoted to a, or asked to take on a ministerial post with the government, and he's provided uh, a tremendous amount of support for what we're trying to do. And in a second, I'll tell you about the complications in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and, uh, and the prince has been just uh, uh, fundamental in helping us move forward. The company is a small junior. We are transitioning from being a um, resource explorer and developer into being a producer. Um, that was partly around the, the board reconstruction you just saw, which happened in the last year and a half. We have a small corporate office in Perth, Australia, in the south, southwest, and then again we talk about a um, zinc, uh, zinc over copper project in Saudi Arabia, and then I'll talk a bit about uh, copper over gold in Oman. A little bit about zinc, and I'm not sure how many people follow zinc, it's, it's without uh, meaning to be, use a pun, it's been a very lackluster metal for, for 10 years, uh, that's no longer the case, and it really prefaces the, the mine site. You know, I'm not here as uh, selling zinc, but zinc really is, by and large, 50-55% uh, of it is used for galvanizing, and the rest of it you can see brass and bronze, and then some alloying, which also has a, uh, a rust inhibiting uh, component. So a big, big part of the zinc mining um, market is in galvanizing. Um, that market is growing considerably. Uh, people who follow the construction field specifically, and something as very simple as black bar or reinforcing in concretes, People have been building very, very quickly in China, very, very quickly in India and around the world in growth and population. They're building quickly. They're not using uh, galvanized or treated materials and now they're rebuilding. That's come to an end. The, the building standards are way up, so the use of galvanized is starting to, to skyrocket. Um, it was for those that heard this morning in the opening uh, talk uh, for, from His Excellency, which was excellent, you would have picked up that zinc is, is uh, the market is changing uh, drastically. The last time we saw this type of shift in the market was almost exactly 10 years ago, and I'll, I'll pop that up in a second. You can see in the, starting last year, and for the next bunch of years, next three years, you'll see about 11.3%, this is on a flat line basis, 11.3% of the zinc market is, is coming off. That's primary supplies, that's mines shutting down. I talked about uh, Century Zinc at 500,000 tons a year, and it's in the process of shutting down now, and it's the largest. And there's a series of those you see uh, on the right-hand side. In contrast to that, over that same period, only about half of that's coming on in new supply. About 6% is coming back. And for those of you that follow um, uh, mine constructions and primary producers, the uh, surety of these uh, properties coming online on schedule is obviously quite variable. It's, it's uh, quite common for mines to be late, not early. So you see on a very flat line basis, so if there's no change in, in, in demand, you see that zinc, in fact, is, is losing its supply side. And the, the fundamental there is for 10 years, literally 10 years, it's been lackluster. People have gone off and chased gold when it hit $1,800 an ounce, et cetera, and they saw uh, iron ore go to $180 plus a ton. It was very sexy. So we went off and looked for those things and did our joint ventures and drilled for them. And we didn't touch zinc. We didn't touch zinc for a lot of years. And the outcome is 11, 12 percent is coming off, 6 percent is coming back. And the 6 percent, some of those mines, if, if you go through them, some of them are, are difficult cost-wise and some of them are, are delayed for various, various reasons. Fascinating stats on zinc. Um, the, top, the top graph is, is really interesting. From 1995 onward, the demand for zinc has grown steadily. And you can see in the last five years, it's, it's almost been, uh, been, been rigid year-on-year uh, -year demand that, that, that's increased. The, um, you can see, as I spoke to a second ago, the graph on the bottom, the two colored lines, you can see it was about a year ago that they crossed. And that's a very sort of Keynesian supply-demand curve, where the primary supply 
did not meet the uh, instantaneous demand. So I'll show you a graph in a second. There is zinc in supply, in stockpile, but that won't last forever to fill that gap. So last year, those curves cross, and they're, they're uh, scheduled to be in deficit for the next five to six years as a minimum. This actually highlights that point very clearly. You can, and I won't, uh, I won't try to run through all of the statistics. It's just a real sort of a clear graph. You can see this, this time frame here. I'm sorry for the, um, the hieroglyphics of the small text. I'll, I'll pick up the highlights on these slides. You can see it was 10 years ago where we went in deficit. We were, we were short about 400,000 tons of zinc a year, primary production. The forecast going forward in the next couple of years is double that. It's literally double the shortfall. Okay? Back in this cycle, in those three years, it took three years to work down the stockpiles of zinc. We're anticipating about the same activity here. It'll be, it goes off the graph a little bit, about three years to, to work it down. And you can see the price heading up. The, um, the quote I don't put on the page, and I think it was just an omission, it's the, it's the strongest quote. CRU has the strongest or most bullish outlook, and they're predicting uh, zinc to go to about $2 a pound. Currently, it's sitting today at about $1.04, $1.05 a pound. Uh, at uh, December, it was about $0.84 cents a pound. So zinc has started that reflection and that rise up, um, and you'll see a little later on how that prices into my project. Very, very telling graph, though. It's, uh, it's a 10-year cycle, and, and it started already. And those of you who follow the markets, there are a lot of pundits that, um, that have, a, have other statistics. Let me talk a bit about the zinc project we have. And as I said earlier, this project uh, has a completed and very, very robust feasibility study. It was finished 18 months ago. It was ready to go into finance and construction, and I'll, I'll touch on those in order. Uh, and it's been sitting idle with a problem with our JV partners uh, relinquishing the mining license into the JV agreement. So it's a very, very interesting setup to have a, a completed DFS, very robust. We found additional upside in the project, yet we're still trying to work through some of the logistics of, of a difficult partner. Again, I promise not to read slides, certainly not this time of the day, um, but I will pull out some highlights. Uh, I'll talk a teeny bit about Saudi. Many of you know, obviously, intimately about Saudi, but Saudi from a mining perspective, um, I'm a Canadian by nature with my junior career. I've worked in, worked or lived in Brazil, South Africa, Papua New Guinea, currently living in Australia, and I've worked uh, across Australia as well. Of all the places in the world on balance, whether it's the fiscal regime or the technical regime, I have not to date found anything quite as exciting as Saudi Arabia. And I'll explain that briefly without uh, becoming their tourist bureau. Um, the, the Saudi government was very, very wise. And a number of years ago, in the late 60s, early 70s, they realized that the oil and gas, which was just recently discovered, would need to have something to fall into afterwards. And they'd made a very concerted effort to go exploring from a national level. They brought in the French. Uh, uh, BRGM to start in the 70s. They did about half a billion dollars worth of exploration, not sort of hands-off aeromagnetic type of things, on the ground uh, geochem and drilling. They've discovered a number of deposits, just a massive number of deposits, m a large number of them on the west side in the Arabian Shield in that greenish color. Um, and then that's all been fully mapped, it's all been digitized, it's all in public record, it's all ready to go. The estimate, the base estimate, and I don't think this is flushed out, there's probably 40 fully identified resources. There's probably 15 of those that could go into an international feasibility study and within a year to a year and a half be ready to construct. Uh, and at the current time, the country has nine operating mines, six of which are owned by a 50% government, 50% public uh, Madden mining company, very, very good mining company. It is really technically a uh, first mover status. Okay? really, really uh, early stage. They are very, very keen. When I say that, I'm talking about the um, Saudi Arabian government. It's been very, very forward looking, very visionary. They're very, very keen on mining. There are uh, a number of points on the slide. The last one is, is probably pretty telling. And this has been out in the press in the last uh, three to four weeks pretty strongly with a couple of Saudi ministers. The Saudi government said we have three pillars going forward financially. One is obviously around oil and gas, which is a mainstay. The second is around creating Saudi Arabia as a financial center for the Middle East. And to that end, they, they've chosen six cities, and they're building what I call these canary wharves um, uh, in the desert. Uh, incredible uh, you know, four or five block square uh, infrastructures at six different cities for, uh, to, house, to house financial institutions and attract them. Uh, and the third one is mining. So the governments have come out and said, we've got three pillars to, to run forward financially. One of them is mining. Very, very odd. Very odd to find that in the world. Very, very broad. Um, again, um, Saudi Arabia is an interesting country from a broad brush perspective. You're in, a, in an area of the world that's got 
lots of uh, civil strife now. There are also some insurgencies, etc. Saudi Arabia is very, very stable. We heard some statistics earlier this morning. Um, the country rating, you know, this is sort of an international risk rating. You can see the little triangle, depending on which, which aspect of the risk. Saudi is very, very, very solidly uh, in an investment in the portfolio. It's the second Middle East in the, um, in, for investment, you heard that it sits right behind the United Arab Emirates, where we are today. A uh, member of the G20, really, really solid commercial environment. When I sit down with potential investors for our company or other financiers and we talk about Saudi Arabia, I actually run through uh, most of these things a little more carefully, a little more slowly. By the time I get halfway down the page, you can see the financier's eyes roll over. It feels too much like a fairy tale. Um, you can pick out any one of these items. There are no national royalties. You're able to uh, repatriate your, your earnings. Um, there's no, for mining, just for mining, there's no import-export duties from the mining industry because it is one of the strategic pillars. And the list goes on. So I include this not to, to bog you down in detail, but if people are interested to follow this up, it's a tremendous spot to be from a, from a commercial and a technical aspect. One of the reasons we're in there now, very, very helpful. One of the things that makes it very possible for a junior to work in Saudi Arabia, one of the things that goes counter-current to the current market, when you talk to people in the junior sector, they say, geez, my problem is getting money, it's to finance. I may have a great project, I may have a great uh, upside potential, but I just can't get funds. We've heard some very good talks earlier today about that. Saudi Arabia is the exception to the rule. One of the reasons for that, not just its, its mental wealth, and its, its incredible technical effect, one of the reasons is the Saudi Investment Development Fund. This fund was set up to grow industrial entities in Saudi Arabia. Those that aren't aware, it's been very, very successful to date. It's very unusual for a typical investment fund. It's not trying to make interest. It's not trying to make money. It's not appropriate under Sharia law. But that's also not their mandate. Their mandate is purely to develop industry in, in the country for employment and for wealth and to carry on from the oil and gas. You can see the sorts of levels of investment. Over, over two billion just in 2012. Um, and it's rising. You can see the rate of investment. There are, it's well funded and it's well supported. For a project that I'm about to speak to, starting on the next slide, we'll talk about the same project in Saudi Arabia. They have three zones, zone one, two, three, one being around the cities, or, 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 or uh, urban, zone three, rural. We're in zone three, which has the highest capability for this funding. It allows us to fund in, in a debt uh, scenario up to 75% at very, very low rates and average it's not interest, of course, but an indicative cost of capital. It's about three to three and a half percent over the first seven years, and then after that, it basically drops off to nothing with, with flexible in the terms. So to study this alone, this alone, this facility, if, you're, if your project qualifies, this alone gives you a massive leg up on almost any other financial jurisdiction in the world. Um, I will talk now, that's sort of the overview of Zinc, and Talked a bit about why we're in Saudi Arabia. I'll just talk a bit about the nuts and bolts of the project itself because I find that, that, that obviously very exciting as well. Um, we have an office, uh, Riyadh, in the center of the country, the capital. We have a, our site is 170 kilometers southwest of Riyadh. It is uh, very simple, I'll show you a second, a second, three separate little pits. Um, very, very, um, if I can say this carefully, very unexciting from a technical perspective. It's very basic open pit mining with good rock stability, uh, three separate pits on a, on a geological system that goes north and south into depth. We've only explored a very, very small part of it. It's about cash and time, cost and time, excuse me. Um, uh, and it sits in a designated mining zone, which means it's, it's, it's easier and quicker to permit, and that's just luck of the draw. It has three domains on it, and I won't run into a lot of geology, but there are zinc-rich and, and copper-rich domains. They are all blended together, and we do campaigning of that sort. Um, the, the number two domain, which is the zinc-rich domain, it actually runs at about 5.8% zinc. That'll become a, a material in a second when we talk about upgrading it. Just a quick layer of the land. It sits on a mining, a fairly large mining lease surrounded by exploration. This is very sort of typical setup. <coughs> so the, I touched on it earlier, the geology is, is extremely, <coughs> extremely robust. Um, as in all mines, since they have to develop with time and, and, and drilling. So we'll do more of that, obviously, once we get into operation and have, have, have strong cash flows. Um, the current, uh, I open the discussion by being frank and talking a bit about the project being so robust and solid, but we're stalled. 
a number of months ago, we had to announce that we were at an impasse to the market. And the reason being that for the last 18 months now, our joint venture partner uh, hasn't been willing to move forward with the agreement. Uh, we had an initial 50-50 joint venture um, uh, with the United Arabian Mining Company, as we call it, the Menage. Um, we had a 50-50 joint venture. They're difficult at the best of times, but with a great relationship, they're possible. It would not have been possible with this relationship. Uh, so we then went forward earlier in the year, we re renegotiated, renegotiated a new relationship at 60-40, so, so Alara would clearly be in the managerial lead and be able to finance and, and construct <clears throat> and operate. Um, and unfortunately our partner hasn't, hasn't followed suit on that, 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 that agreement either. Thus the delay we're incurring right now, and we've actually put a number of, of other um, strategies and plans in place to, 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 um, to move out of that situation where the mining licenses are locked in with them. So it's a project that is sitting in the zinc up market, a very robust project with lots of, of uh, identified upside, just waiting to, to get the, 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 the keys to the car, so to speak. Again, I'm not going to bog you down in a thousand statistics. I just want to give you a sense of uh, scope and scale. Uh, on, on average, um, it's about an 80,000 ton a year zinc mine with a little bit of, I call it copper credits, 5,000 tons of copper. Not as significant. We peak up at about 100,000 tons a year. What is um, uh, materially important to note is that one of the things that we've been able to do with the period after the feasibility was completed was to look at that upside I touched on. One of the things we tested was an early stage uh, high grading technique called heavy media separation. For about $1.25 a ton, you can run a coarse product, a two, three centimeter product um, through a, a simple separation, take out some of the silicas and bring your grade up. And it has proven successful at a, at a lower level, the scoping level, and uh, we may be able to, uh, to close to double those throughputs. Once you do that, you have one of the top 10 uh, zinc producers in the world. Gives you a sense of the plant layout. Um, plant has um, a number of upsides. I, I won't troll through them. Um, it's not a sales pitch as such, but we do. Um, we have designed it for two million tons a year. Uh, the plant itself has over capacity of 2.4 million tons. The way the project works best is to mine a high volume up front to stockpile lower grade ore and put the higher grade ore in early. That means almost from the first six months you have stockpiles of ore in front of you. So if you have plant capacity, you have uh, material that is off, off balance sheet in the process. Um, so that's, that is a operational upside. We won't, we won't put that in the, in, the, in the study. We also have an oxide cap, as many ore bodies do. The oxide cap has quite a bit of metal in it. That's not factored in as well. So we'll put that to the side. Once the sulfide main deposits produce, we'll, uh, we'll come back and have a separate, separate exercise and start extracting down from the oxides. So there's no, and that's just a couple of the, the highlights, but there's a number of upsides left in the project. <coughs> just for the financiers in the group to give you a sense of its financial robustness. Um, it's interesting to note, we went through this recently and uh, in, 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 for a number of processes, when a feasibility study gets delayed, i.e. the work is complete and it's accurate and current, and time passes on, it's usually very detrimental to a feasibility study. The metal price normally stays stays pretty flat typically, unless you're lucky like we are, and then your operating costs and your capital costs tend to go up and your, your margins or your, your value starts to drop. We've been uh, very lucky in that since the time we finished our feasibility study 18 months ago, a little over 18 months ago, the metal price has gone up as we had forecasted. It now surpasses what's in our feasibility study, which is obviously unusual. Um, our, our operating cost has actually flattened and gone down slightly. Uh, due to some of the upsides we found in some of the labor market strengthening in our favor and our capex has stayed flat. We have a fully bid and tendered EPC contracts of 250, 257 million is a, is a fixed and firm number and they have they have actually extended that uh, that bid for another 12 months. So it's, it's an unusual situation so it's a, it's a little bit of risk mitigation for an investor. Again, we talked about uh, uh, upsides. I don't want to troll through them. These are always um, very positive. You'll never capture all of these, whether it's the time you have or whether they, they pan out. But you can see on the capital side, um, there's opportunities to simplify your crushing circuit. We've taken a very conservative view in terms of how coarse and how, how um, hard the rock is. It's much softer than that, so there's, uh, there's some savings both in the capital and the operating, but they're significant for a, a $260 million project to have a potential pool of, this is the low hanging fruit, this, these are the easier items of, of anywhere from sort of 60 to 80 million dollars uh, potential 
production is, is, is not uh, immaterial for us. And of course, on the operating side, um, excuse the slippage of the numbers, on the operating side, um, these are all life and one. They're all life and one. They're not obviously the first couple of years, but uh, there's significant potential there as well if we're going to the property. Um, some of, the, some of the, the questions that come up typically are really around, and I've touched on this earlier again, are really around, geez, a junior in the Middle East, it's difficult, it's got sort of a lot of things happening uh, geopolitically, socially, um, militaristically. Uh, how are you going to finance this? How, how are you going to get the confidence up to finance? We talked a bit about the SIDF. We indicated that that, or indicated that that could finance to the level of 75%, which is almost unheard of. Not to be overly confident, but we, if that's granted, if your project um, uh, gets that acceptance, the way the formula works, that funding is in real terms only 257 million, it's about 80 to 83 percent. That leaves a funding gap of between 40 to 45 million, which is relatively um, manageable. And one of the strange anomalies to that sort of government support to get that 80 to 83 percent support, you must secure your revenue stream. So normally you wouldn't want to tie up your metal, you want to keep it on the spot market or a good portion of it. The, the flip side for us is we will have to tie up in the order of 85% of our metal for the first couple of years. So we have to secure the revenue stream to get that kind of, of, of government funding. We're quite happy to do that. It's not conventional wisdom. Very happy to do that, certainly in the zinc market. Um, and what that does is it creates quite a uh, quite an interest to the to the smelters and the off takers, the metal off takers. We're in discussion with, with 11 different groups, uh, and it's borderline aggressive. They're borderline aggressive about getting a hold of the zinc in this zinc market. So they are offering uh, for that 40 or 45 million uh, finance gap. The smelters and off takers are giving us preliminary indications, some of it on paper, that they are prepared to 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 finance that. Um, in a second, I'll talk about the strengths of the project, but even the EPC vendors. Those of you that are in that sector of supplying these uh, engineering, procurement, and construction firms, they're very lean right now. They're very, very keen to be building something, especially mines. They're offering project finance as well. So I won't go through the whole list, but you can stream your copper, uh, a tool used a fair bit in the last three years, uh, royalties. There's, there are a number of avenues to, 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 to fund that gap of 40 to 45 million. So where normally the finance would keep a junior mining company up at night trying to figure out how to get through that, that's not our concern. Uh, that's not our biggest worry, it's certainly a concern. Our problem right now is actually getting those mining licenses unlocked. Um, one of the things with all mine production, those that have invested in it personally or professionally, they always come in late, they always come in over cost. Over 63% of projects fail, um, and when I say fail, it means uh, in a project sense, you're either or 25% over time or 25% over cost. That's, that's considered a project failure. 63% of these, of these new mines uh, don't make it over the line. We're very, very focused on that. We understand that cycle very, very well. Um, it's, it's, done, it's done for all the right and wrong reasons. It's, it's enthusiasm, it's, it's unforeseen risk, uh, it's market driven. I'm not gonna get into that. Um, our two risks on this project we put right up front. We've looked at it very carefully. They're flagged in the feasibility study. We've done an independent peer review of the feasibility study uh, after the fact, and they validated these. The two of them are water. Water in Saudi Arabia is critical. And the second is to make sure that our mining license, the mining license area, covers all of the deposit. Right now, we mine right to the edge, and there's issues around that. So we've dealt with both of them. We've been able to, to secure a water supply to the door on a, on a rate. Uh, it's actually less, uh, less, co less cost operationally than our feasibility, and it removes about 18 million of capex. Um, so that's our primary risk. The second risk is around the mining licenses, and that really is tied into unlocking those from our JV partner, and that's underway now. Some of the things that you, unless you're building a mine that you don't think about in this market, but I think is quite interesting, because the market is so difficult and it's desperate in some areas, that leaves those EPC firms, the, the, the construction firms, very, very, very lean. They've got good people that are ready to build projects. Uh, people that are normally doing billion dollar projects um, are, are prepared to build your 200 million dollar project, so you're going to get the, the top of their uh, food chain, if, if you would. Um, the project directors, there, there, are, there are people on the street now that you'd never see them without a job, and yet they're looking for something to do to stay busy. They're a very select group of people that can do this sort of thing well, but they're available, and, and often a company our size couldn't, couldn't get a hold of them, and they'd be tied up with the, with the majors. 
uh, and likewise for the owner's team. So although this is an extremely difficult market in a broad sense, and I absolutely accept that, if you're going out to build a mine, you've, you, you, it's, um, in a sense, it's a builder's market. Um, again, the strengths, we've touched on a number of these. We're sitting right on a highway. We've right on a power grid. The power grid will, 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 will be able to supply us enough power for the camp and the ancillary. We'll have to put in a power plant to run the processing plant. But it does get you up and started. It gets you easy, you know, it's a lot easier to construct when you have power. Um, uh, really, we talked about the rest of these. Uh, lots and lots of strengths for this, both the country, both technically. The, the, uh, in, in one of the earlier slides, you know, something is bizarre or something is unusual, if I could, excuse me, is in 2004, the Saudi Arabian government rewrote their mining act, and they rewrote it to attract investment. Uh, that's not common. Very often these acts are rewritten to enhance the environmental protection or the indigenous people's protection or other, other drivers through, through the political forums. They rewrote it to, to specifically and defini definitively attract foreign investment and foreign expertise into mining. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's very positive. Uh, just to talk about the way forward, and this would be sort of any, any project that's going into construction. Um, it's really about getting the mining licenses secured, putting your team together at the same time, putting your finance together, and then initiating under control. This is an indicative timetable. Um, this one really needs filtering with a grain of salt because the uh, blue bar is our best um, uh, estimate of how long it will take to unlock those mining licenses. Um, uh, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a, a super conservative estimate, but it certainly is a pragmatic es estimate. We may be able to, to do better than the, uh, than the uh, mid-year next year to get those fully secured. Um, uh, but uh, that's what we're, we're laying out now so we're clear and making sure we're, we're managing our business accordingly. And then after that, we have a nine-month um, finance phase. That's really driven around that SIDF finance. Um, they are documented and they, they typically will finance in six months, um, but we just want to be a little bit careful that we don't, you know, we don't count on that. So we're saying there's a nine in the green a nine-month uh, project finance, and then there's a two-year construction schedule. Um, and that will be the construction schedule. We will stay with that. That won't vary. Uh, we have spoken to three EPC firms. One of them has given us our capital quote. All three of them believe that the, the project can be brought in in less time than that. We will stay with the two, we'll stay with the two-year construct. And if we bring in it earlier, then we'll, uh, we'll issue bonuses to both project directors and to the uh, EPC firm. Um, uh, really, you know, the sort of the sales pitch, if you would, at the very end of the project. Uh, we've talked about being in the, the right spot. Uh, metal is just luck of the draws on the rise. Um, the ore body's just got length and depth in it. It's open to the north and south, each of the three pits, and, and, and at depth. Um, we've got a team in place now that are ready to, to, to construct. Um, we think it's the perfect time for the market, as I talked about the EPC availability and directors and, and key people. Um, we are very, very conscious, once again, at the risk of reiterating on how many times these first projects fail, especially in new countries. So we're putting in a lot of risk mitigation. It, uh, it's around corporate reputation and it's around your next project. Uh, your next project depends on the first, really, so this one has to be right. Uh, and then really, one of the things I haven't touched on, but it was touched on beautifully in, in the previous, a um, couple of previous uh, presentations really is, we, f we strongly support that. The, the stakeholder engagement isn't a glib sort of a line for us. It happens at the expiration stage. We're working with that very strongly right now, and we have very, very strong support regionally, locally. Um, we have to hold back the support because we're in this delay period. The town of Alguaya, which is about 20 uh, kilometers from the mine site, uh, they've they brought us in with their Chamber of Commerce and we had a very, very uh, uh, ornate and very, very um, uh, spectacular lunch with them and they wanted to show us the, the site where they're going to build the mining school. They're going to build a mining school to train people for our mine and we said, look, you, you better slow up a little bit here. <laughs> We're not quite ready for that. But there's a great deal of support and that, that community relations and government relations is fundamental as we know. The summary of it, I think you've seen all of this before. It's a two million zinc project in a zinc cycle. Very robust feasibility, all sorts of upside in it we're dying to get our hands on. Uh, really, right now, it's about unlocking those mining licenses, and, uh, and they're under threat. They've been idle for too long under government uh, legislation, so um, things are progressing in the government level and in, 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 our, in our commercial level. 
I will close shortly. I just have a couple of brief slides um, around Oman. Oman's very, very important to us as well. It is a one, one stage behind. We have just recently completed a very advanced scoping study. Uh, we don't call it a pre because there's a couple of areas that probably wouldn't qualify, but it is a very significant piece of work, uh, 140 pages without appendices, uh, done very diligently on uh, JORC resource, et cetera. So it's um, not your typical scoping study. The project is ready to move into a feasibility study. So we're out in the market now looking at how we can uh, bring funds into the company and specifically the project to do that. Um, it, is a, it is a different style setup. It is what I call loosely a hub and spoke. So um, the, large, the large amount of metal sits in the Washihi deposit, uh, south, southwest of Muscat. And then it has feeders. There are a number along the ridge, the mountain range along the Omani coast, are a number of known high-grade deposits, too small to, to support their own infrastructure and their own uh, processing plant, but an absolutely beautiful feeder system for a hub. So you put a hub in Washihi, and then you bring your, your spokes in if you want, or your number of smaller deposits, and they, they augment and feed and supplement that plant. So, so that's the project we're looking at. It very, was very successful. Um, there were, we looked at three cases. These cases were, were as I say, they're very, um, they, they'll sound and feel a bit more like a pre or feasibility because we took a very uh, pragmatic or conservative view to it. But um, there's a base case with complete JORC resource. We then have a MULAG uh, deposit, very uh, high-grade MULAG deposit with a couple of holes in it. It's not at a measured and indicated level, but we've, we've got the advanced base case. And then we have a target case, which is an ex which is a official JORC expiration target. It's not a... Um, blue sky case, or a, what I call an arm waving case. This is a geologically backed up case with drill holes and data. They're just not uh, measured or indicated. We ran, so you basically got um, a half a million ton a year case and a million ton a year case. The, um, uh, under the uh, Australian ASX reporting rules, we can't lay out on, on, on the slide all of the details of this, but I can talk to them. Um, I certainly won't try and read this to you, but basically in the target case, uh, it, it, runs, it runs about 157 million NPV. So it basically takes, um, takes a big leap up. Very, very conservative case studies. Uh, we've got 20% mining dilution in there. We have the additional cost of ore over waste of about 58%. Very conservative numbers. Our, our study consultant, uh, because of the JORC resource, decided to do it at a very, very, um, as he puts it, rock solid level. So we went with that, but um, it gives you a very good foothold going into a feasibility study. Very often in feasibility studies, a lot of your economics fall through the floor of a project. I think ours will, will actually enhance. Um, again, I'm, uh, I leave this on the slide for those that may have some interest. They can, they can get a copy of the presentation, of course, and, and troll through this at their will. But um, we're quite excited about this. We, we hope to, uh, in less than two months, to have this financed into a feasibility study, or if not, looking at other commercial options. And there's quite a bit of interest um, around the world for this project, uh, whether it's a jo joint ventured or, or, or other commercial opportunities. So we're looking at all, all of those aspects right now. To close, to close out, um, really the, 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 uh, the elevator speech, as they call it, the, the two second takeaway, really there's a two million ton, very robust zinc project in a zinc cycle in a terrific country in which to mine who wants to have you there. And we've just got to unlock the mining licenses because they're with uh, JV partners that are clearly not going to move forward uh, on the licenses or with ourselves. And in Oman, we have a slightly smaller project in uh, copper and gold that's very robust as well, and it's, it's ready to go into a, a feasibility study and then, then into construction. And that's it. <laughs>